In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The word of God which engaged us today is from John chapter 1. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. John starts his gospel with a phrase that we all recognize, in the beginning. And we know what comes next. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But it's not what John says. Instead, he says, in the beginning was the word. The word made all things, and nothing was made apart from the word. God spoke everything into being through his word, through his son. And then John goes on and builds up and up and up, describing God's activity in the world. The true light was coming into the world. To all who received him, he gave the right to become children of God. John wows us and amazes us. Look at how good our God is. And then, ja and then John caps it all off by saying, and the word became flesh. To this point, you're supposed to say, he did what? It became flesh? The word became flesh. This was something new in creation, something new in human history. Now, there were times in the Old Testament when the pre-incarnate Son of God would reveal himself to his people. Sometimes he appeared as a man. So this was called a theophany. For example, in Genesis 32, when, when, um, when Jacob is going back up to his brother Esau after cheating him out of the birthright, well, Jacob's going back up, and a man wrestled with Jacob all night long. And in the morning, he put Jacob's hip out of joint. Well, who was this man? It was the Lord. He says, you have striven with God and with man and have prevailed. And Jacob also recognizes, I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. With Jacob, the Lord appeared as a man, but then he disappeared in that form. But when John says that the word became flesh, it's something more. If Jesus merely appeared to be a man, if he only looked like he was born as us and died as us, if he only wore humanity as a costume, we could take the costume off. If Jesus only took on our flesh or assumed our flesh, well, he could unassume it. He could take it off. But John says clearly and powerfully, and the word became flesh. The Son of God has incorporated being a man into his very identity. God with you. God as you. The Son of God is now a man. This is irreversible. This is new. He cannot go back into being the pre-incarnate Son of God. Jesus is a man, and he always will be from now on. Jesus ascended into heaven in his flesh, and this is how it always will be. He cannot take it off. This is who he is now. Now, it's worth noting that Jesus did not change into a man in the sense that he's no longer God. John clarifies, we have seen his glory. Well, whose glory? All, all this time he's been talking about the word, uh, the word who is the Son of God, the word who is fully God. Now, you and I are, are used to talking about how Jesus is fully God, he's fully man, you know, 100%, 100%. We learn this in, in, in catechism. But the early church had to defend this truth against heretics who said, the math doesn't add up. One plus one cannot equal one. Think of it this way. What if Joseph, 
on that, on that Christmas Eve with you know, Mary holding the, 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 the Christ child there, what if Joseph had said, this baby, he's the, the one who was running the universe, the one who was feeding everybody, the one who was governing the affairs of men, is now this child? Is that right? Well, Mary would have responded, no, actually, that's not right. He is the one running the universe. He is the one who's still feeding us. He is the one who's governing us. And he's getting hungry. So if you wouldn't mind. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as the only son of the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, when did the disciples see the glory of the Son of God most clearly? You might say that it was at his transfiguration. When Jesus peeled back the veil covering his divinity just a little bit, his face, his face shone, his clothes were radiantly white. And God the Father said, this is my beloved Son, listen to him. But that was not when the disciples most clearly saw God's glory. You might say it was at his resurrection, when, when Jesus unlocked the prison of death. He would not let Mary Magdalene cling to him, kind of like how God wouldn't let his people approach and touch the mountain of, of Mount Sinai or when he wouldn't let Moses approach the burning bush because of his glory there. You're, you're on a holy ground. But this too, the resurrection, was not when the disciples most clearly saw God's glory. Instead, they saw the glory of the eternal Son of God most clearly when he was high and lifted up and exalted above the earth on a cross. This was the hour for which Jesus came, the time when he would draw all people to himself, when he would most clearly reveal himself to us as the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. John is saying, we saw the word die on a cross. We saw the glory of the eternal Son of God when he sacrificed himself for us. After all, Jesus could not save you from death if he did not become you and die. He cannot keep the law on your behalf if he remained simply God. He cannot be struck by the serpent and thereby crush his head unless he became mortal, human, you. In order to save you from your sins, the eternal Son of God had to become just like you, yet without sin. The Creator had to enter his creation as a creature. And this is after the fall. Creation is no longer beautiful. The Lego master became a minifig built in a spaceship made by a three-year-old with all of the, with parts of all the wrong color and just the wrong pieces, just an ugly thing. The creator of tulips and, and basil walked through cities where the sewers did not run underground. The sewer was the ground, if you take the meaning. The glorious judge of all humanity knew the sins of everyone he ever met. And he carried them. He took away our sins. He became you. He wore your filthy rags. He took your filth upon himself. 
Dear Prince in Christ, this is what it took to save you. Jesus had to go through that humiliation for you and for me. And this is to our great shame. But Jesus sees it as his crowning achievement. The word became flesh for the singular purpose of gaining you. He was happy to do it. Christmas is Christ's gift to you. Merry Christmas. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We stand and sing the